Okay, I think we can get started. So for those who don't know me, I'm Nicolas and uh, I'm not Joelle. I'm replacing Joelle who's, who's sick today, unfortunately. And it is my great pleasure to um, introduce Animesh Garg, uh, who's giving today's talk. Um, he's a professor at uh, Georgia Tech, um, where he leads the People, AI and Robotics group. Before joining Georgia Tech, he was a PhD student at UC Berkeley and then a postdoc at Stanford. His research is, um, is about generaliz generalizable autonomy, which I guess is also going to be uh, the talk of, uh, of, uh, of the topic of today's talk. So, without further delay, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks a lot. Let me share screen and let's get started. Mm. Do you now see the screen? Yes, we see the screen. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Nicholas, and, and thanks a lot, Julie, who is not here, but uh, I'm, I'm super glad to be talking to all of you, and, and because this has been recorded for people who are going to watch this later. I am Animesh Gur. I'm currently a senior researcher at NVIDIA, and I will be starting as, as a faculty at Georgia Tech. I've spent the last few years as faculty at University of Toronto and at the Institute. And a lot of the work that I'm going to present today is through collaborations at Toronto, NVIDIA, and many other institutions uh, that I work with. So let's get started. Uh, as a researcher or, or even as a trainee in robotics, something that has fascinated me is the ability to build robots that would essentially be able to be deployed in open-ended scenarios, something like a home. And this is something of a problem that has fascinated me for many years. I really have liked thinking about this problem for the last eight years. Uh, to a point, a lot of my friends uh, in the community told me that you never changed the first slide. And I said, uh, mostly because we haven't really solved the problem. <laughs> so, and what is the problem? Well, the problem is very simple. The problem is we want a system that can do multiple sets of tasks. Maybe if you're thinking in the context of a home robot, it can be cleaning, cooking, laundry, and so on and so forth. And you want to do these kinds of things beyond the lab. You want them to actually work when you deploy them in, let's say, structured, open, open, semi-structured environments. Let's say you bring a robot to your home and it should work. What does that problem entail? That problem entails two, two issues. One, we need a mechanism to specify the task. We cannot be tuning reward functions and cost functions. We need mechanisms to specify tasks through variety of inputs. The input can be visual, language, demonstrations. And we need a framework of algorithms which can, in a sense, take this input and execute the task in a constrained environment. That is what I would call one aspect or one pillar of this research. And the other pillar of this research would be taking this input, the algorithm needs to have some framework to be able to generalize. I will describe what generalization means, but for now you can assume that generalization in this simple example is someone tells you how to build a chair and then you can understand the concept of a chair to build new chairs. And, and this is what I would argue is the whole binding ace aspect of a lot of my work, which is reasoning and control for embodied systems to be able to perform general set of tasks. Okay, this is still, I would argue, too general. Uh, uh, at least like, what are we trying to do? If we were to attempt these problems, how can we, let's say, go about this as roboticists or maybe as robot learning? There are two ways to look at this problem. One way to look at this problem is let me build a framework to attempt this. So this can be that I'm given a particular problem. I will create a solution out of it. That solution could very well be structured. I will build a perception schema, a planning and a control schema for that particular problem. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is something that we do very, very routinely in, in robotics. And, uh, and it has actually gotten us very far. The new sort of... Uh, viewpoint could be, and, and I would even argue this is a very sort of, um, uh, let's say, extreme viewpoint, that if you somehow just have a lot of data, then 
we can in principle learn to do this. Now, the problem is both of these, both of these frameworks have some sort of uh, limitations. In, in the more conventional framework, we have a need for a lot of experts. There is a, a performance versus flexibility trade-off and it's limited applicability of the solution. So if I study a lot of the things about one particular problem, it doesn't necessarily apply to other problems. On the other hand, data isn't easy because first of all, data is not available to everyone. Even if data is available, compute is not available. And even if both of them are, then it's at least currently what things show that they are out of distribution errors. So even if you had a lot of data and a lot of compute, you're not actually able to solve, solve the problem. So what, what is the problem? My argument here is that we really need to study models and structures. If you look at machine learning, going back two centuries, from philosophy to psychology to machine learning to deep learning, all of the pioneers have argued that to achieve generalization, in the sense that you to build general purpose models, you need what is called an inductive bias or an inductive leap. And I'm quoting directly from uh, the famous book that Tom Mitchell had uh, in the early 80s that many of us have actually read as part of our courses. What is the whole argument? Now, the simple crux of the argument is there is no generalization without structure. Let me define what the word structure here is. Structure can mean many things, but structure is a kind of thing which you put in as your information what data doesn't provide. So structure can be saying that I am trying to predict poses of an object. The fact that you're making the perception module predict SE3 quantities is structure. Uh, domain knowledge, any sort of inductive bias, symmetries and priors can be thought of as structure. And the argument is that there is no generalization without structure, right? You need to know certain things about the problem to be able to ask the question, wouldn't generalize. Now, this is not a replacement for data. We should be very clear that it's structure plus data and data itself can come in many flavors, online versus offline, simulation versus real, labeled, self-supervised, sometimes human in the loop. In fact, one could even argue that if you were to look at what I would call the pillars of modern machine learning, these are three pillars of modern machine learning, large structured models, large scale data sets, and then the ability to use distributed compute and deployment, right? So this is something that has served both vision and language. And the, and the formula for success has been very simple. You think of interesting architectures, these days transformers, you increase the data set size, and sometimes you increase compute and seem, it seems that in the last six to eight years, the performance is kind of, uh, just keeps on increasing with no bound, right? Uh, and and uh, this, has, this has played out very reasonably, particularly for vision and language. Now, if we start thinking of robotics, is that true? It turns out that robotics is slightly different. First of all, robotics violates these assumptions. We don't have structured data, uh, structured models. Uh, at least not at large scale. We definitely don't have very large scale data. And compute, even if we do have access to it, is not really being used because we don't really have the data to use it with. Uh, and the fact that we introduce embodiment in the problem, uh, there are many ways to cheat around the problem uh, that we might give, let's say, a learning system. However, if you look at a lot of inspiration from neuroscience, despite making progress in vision language, neuroscientists argue that the whole notion of intelligence exists because of motion. It is because that we need to move intelligence exists. And all of the other functionalities such as sensory, memory, cognitive function are in service of this motion. Uh, Dan Wolpert uh, has a very beautiful example where he says that there are animals or organisms who in first phase of their life are actually moving and have a brain. And as soon as they find a home, attach themselves to a rock, they eat their brain because there is no need for it. Uh, 
uh, which is basically a very chauvinistic view, movement chauvinistic view, where movement is the primary need for intelligence. As a roboticist, I find, I find this interesting. But more importantly, if you look at more recent results in, in neuroscience, people have argued that structure is something that uh, is built in, and that is why humans have this kind of generalization that we have. A particular example I like is this ability to say that we are built with structure in the sense some of the structure is natural. So this is an example where humans are built to exist in a particular world where identifying faces and scenes provide them the ability to operate in a natural environment that humans face. And because that is the likelihood of set of tasks that they are going to see, uh, we have evolved to have regions in our brain which are specifically attuned to identify faces and uh, scenes. And neuroscientists basically were trying to figure out, is this learned or is this in babies? So they went to find babies very early on uh, as, as young as uh, six months, and, and uh, uh, they were able to show that even when the baby is not able to see very properly, they were able to figure out that, uh, that the infant had particular activations for adult faces. Basically, they were trying to show that human brain is built with wirings, if you will, or, or prior structure for identifying certain tasks. So one lesson here is that a lot of the specialization is actually inbuilt, not learned online. Two, which is on the contrary of this, is we do learn to specialize very quickly. So humans, uh, as, as, um, as has been studied multiple times in different, let's say, fields, are specialized to identify people usually much better from their own races. Why? Because at least evolutionary, it gives me a benefit to identify individuals from my own race. And when I look at individuals from a different race whom I may not, let's say, encounter very often, then I may actually have confusion about them. So I've specialized to identify people who I meet every day. Uh, but I'm, I'm not specialized to, uh, to, to differentiate people who I don't meet. And this actually, this idea can be taken to the extreme where when you look at individuals of other species, you don't actually identify them as single, singletons, but you basically group them as a species. So you, you cannot really identify monkeys. But this is an ability that we develop over time. People have shown, um, for example, Kangli at Toronto, has shown that babies early on can do this. So babies from three months to six months can actually identify individuals from different species. But over time, between nine months to a year, they lose this ability because this is not something that is useful for them. So, and this is not just for vision, by the way. This is also true for languages. Babies are born with the infrastructure to learn different languages, but end up learning only a few. Uh, what this is showing us is, Aside from the ability to specialize in hardware, if you will, we also have the ability uh, to specialize in software. Why is specialization required? Well, specialization results in better performance. We have the right infrastructure to learn many things, but we learn only a few. And which few? Well, the ones that are relevant to us. So this is where I think it brings back to what we are trying to study. To understand the problem of reasoning and control, we need to study structured representations and understand causality in space and time. And for doing that, we study three things uh, in my group. We study how to figure out what structure is needed for robotics. Then we talk about uh, how to discover some of this structure. And finally, as a practical roboticist, we have to discover, we have to figure out how would such thing get deployed. But in today's talk, uh, we'll try to do a deep dive only on the first part of this problem, which is structure. This particular problem itself can be thought of as a few different subtopics. And, and, and we'll start by looking at first perception, 
so object-oriented representations. Then I will go over how we can identify and utilize uh, structure in the process of decision making itself. And finally, we will go from doing skill level uh, decision making to task level decision making using causality. Okay, so let's get started. So let's look at first problem, which is of representation of objects. And to study representation of objects, we started out by looking at something very simple. We were looking at problems of what we would like to think assembly or even some, something simple, mating. In the sense, two objects go together. So a pen and a pen cap goes together. Uh, a toy assembly or packing mangoes in a box are, are harder problems, of course. But there are simpler problems where you can take a pair of objects and try to mate them together. Right. And even doing that seems to be very natural to us because we have a lot of prior, but it is not actually trivial it turns out, uh, especially if you don't know the solution ahead of time. And again, uh, this idea if is done purely geometrically rather than semantically, then it becomes very tricky. For example, if I give you uh, basically shards of a broken vase, can you put it together? Many people can attempt it. Uh, how do we do this? What is the fundamental ability? What do we know about objects and object shapes that allows us to do this? So to study this problem, we started with a simple object data set. And what we did was we took objects and we shattered them. We decided to shatter them in many ways. So in this sense, we are trying to cut these objects in arbitrary ways. And then sometimes we also made them hollow so that the point uh, of interactions of the surfaces that, that match is not um, easy to find always, right? Okay, so this is how we created the data set. So now the problem is, essentially you have these fractured pairs, which can be input as point clouds, and you have to predict uh, through your model what the final configuration of the rigid system would be to put them together, right? So in a sense, we have basically pro uh, posed a problem uh, of uh, assembly as a, a rigid body transformation problem. For every, uh, for every pair of objects, you need to predict a rotation and a translation matrix so that in some frame of reference, let's say in some global frame of reference or a relative frame of reference, you can, you can make them uh, into a whole object. Now, there are a lot of works that people have done uh, where people do registration with point clouds so ICP is iterative closest point, and sparse ICP is basically just a more efficient version of this. And we tried it exactly. And we found it was actually surprisingly bad. Uh, I'll show you some more results uh, later on. Uh, so what we did was, OK, so we said, OK, let's try to do a learning-based approach. In this particular case, we encode the shapes into a point with encoder. And then we learn an attention-based module that predicts these SE3 quantities for each of the objects rotation. But we find that that is not sufficient because just trying to predict two objects together uh, doesn't really get you very far. You really need to understand what are you trying to make. But often in geometric cases, you may not know this. So we add what is called an adversarial prior, which is basically uh, a prior on the fact that the thing that I'm constructing will look like an object that I'm likely to see in a human world, right? So this prior can be constructed as a discriminator or a very large shape database. And uh, this allows us to basically, but notice this is one of those structure points where we are providing structure explicitly uh, to the model. But sometimes even that is not sufficient. So we actually added one more term, which is now allowing us to say that if I see only parts of objects, I should know what the missing part or missing piece might look like. So this is a shape completion loss. We don't use it during testing, but we only use it during training. During training, we assume we have access to the full shape. Hence, uh, you can use this. During testing, you only use the pose estimation or relative pose part of the loss. And now we find that suddenly with these two priors, the shape completion and uh, the adversarial prior enables us to basically reduce error in both translation and rotation by over 100x uh, compared to, let's say, point cloud matching techniques. And we, of course, are doing 
uh, about 10x better than other learning based techniques as well. But really, it's not about, oh, we are the best part. I think we are just getting started. This problem was, I think, proposed this time around for the first time at CVPR 2022 this year. Uh, and ours is only like an initial result. Qualitatively, we get much farther than the usual, but I don't think we have solved the problem yet. Uh, so we can start with arbitrary shapes and, and we can result in interesting, let's say, initializations. Why is this problem interesting? Let's take, let's take one moment to think about this. According to me, this problem is interesting because this is one of the fundamental priors an agent would need if they were to do or even attempt geometric assembly. For example, go from parts to a car or try to build a chair out of, uh, out of pieces of furniture. Uh, so understanding the geometry of how things connect and how would they result in, let's say, a functional object is important. Just for fun, we decided, why are we stopping at only two? We can go from two to K. So we decided to take objects and, and shatter them in many, many, many parts. Uh, this time around, uh, we go from uh, simple assembly to many part assembly. And this time around, uh, we took two different data sets. One is uh, a data set of uh, more human-like data parts from Partnet. And uh, the other data set was actually industrial parts from Thingia 10K. And then uh, we basically are able to shatter these objects in many ways, because again, uh, every object can be shattered in, in multiple modes uh, with multiple number of parts coming out. And we created this data set, which we call Breaking Bad. Uh, this is a paper at NeurIPS this year, uh, which has 1 million uh, uh, instances of object fractures. And the problem is again, very similar, except now this is scaled. So for you have to predict a rotation and translation for every object or every piece uh, for it to be assembled. And it turns out this problem is actually very hard. So our model was built for two parts and we found that uh, uh, our model at least generally did not scale to this problem mostly because many of the parts are very small. So you cannot actually, if I only give you a bottle cap and ask you what the bottle looks like, it can look like very many things. Uh, so if parts are very small, a shape completion doesn't work. Hence our model was not able to scale, but, but even other models when we looked at this uh, had very high error and almost nothing was able to solve this problem. But at the same time, uh, I want to convince you that being able to solve this sort of perception problem is fundamental to, let's say, embodied or robotics agents' ability to solve interesting problems like even peg in hole without giving you a cost function of this is the peg and this is the hole, or, or going from uh, simple assembly or connecting things or even packing. Uh, this, this is a very fundamental problem in so many domains. And not just robotics, by the way, looking at archaeology, medicine, and graphics as well. So, so far, I talked about you can have objects, you can have just parts which have no semantics, and we need ability to represent these objects and priors on these parts uh, so that we can uh, think of general purpose problems such as a set. Let's look at another piece of this. Let's say you are given objects, but how do you use them? So if you are given a particular object, maybe you don't need, know all of the details of the shape, uh, the mechanics of the object, and you are given certain tasks. So let's say in this case, uh, I say there are two tasks, sweeping and hammer. Uh, can we, ahead of time, figure out how to use those objects? Now, many times, a pipeline would go something like this, that you say, uh, I can predict where to grasp this object ahead of time and then attempt the task. But then one, one knows that if you try to grasp the hammer at the center of mass, then it is rarely useful as a hammer uh, because that's not the point. The whole point is to create the momentum. So if you are task aware, you realize that understanding objects and using them may require, an, again, an understanding of the geometry beyond just learning object identities. So I can use my phone as a hammer in principle, 
uh, and and nothing stops me, although it's a very expensive one, uh, but it'll work. Uh, so how do we go about this? We look at an object, in this case, a test time, the object may be unknown. We can look at potential ways to look, grasp the object, and we can say, okay, there are many ways to grasp the object. Let me rank the object grasp such that the selected grasp will result in execution. This is important. If I'm not able to execute the task, then it doesn't matter how good the grasp is. Uh, so this is uh, an evaluation on unknown objects to attempt hammering with where the identity of the object may be or may not be hammered. And yet again, it's not about showing numbers really, uh, but just to show that the problem is to learn geometric mapping of object shapes to, uh, to features that require to be used functionally. And because we were using point cloud inputs, we were able to apply this model directly to the robot where uh, you could now give uh, a robot an image of an arbitrary object and it would select uh, how to grasp this object. The policy in this case is parameterized uh, by simple actions of where to go and how much to rotate. But this was not the only paper we worked on uh, using, using objects, actually. Uh, so this was basically geometrically planning uh, independent objects. Right? So in this case, if you notice that the action is simple, uh, it's reasoning over geometry to figure out how to grasp the object and perhaps where to interact with the object. But we often want to do multi-step reasoning uh, under physical and semantic constraints in this object-oriented environment. So for example, let's consider a very simple task, I would say even a simple cartoon task, where let's say there's a Coke can and I want to slide it over to a particular position of interest, but there's a constraint that the Coke can can never exit uh, the path. Right, so, so this is an easy solution. You can basically push it along the path. Now, what happens if I add other obstacles? It's actually very simple. You would say that if I need to push the co can and I'm given a constraint that, the, that it, it should never exit the path, then maybe clear the path out. And once you have cleared the path, uh, you have a solution. But this is actually very hard because it requires you to do discrete and continuous reasoning in the sense that you have to do some sort of task planning where you have to figure out which object to push. And then there is a continuous part of the plan where, where to push the object. Plan. Now, again, if you know explicit models of the environment, you can do this, but often you don't. So in this particular work, we were uh, learning a joint model where we essentially learn a high level model where you can basically say, if I push this object, what happens to the environment? And then a low level model, uh, which is the dynamics where how much to push it by. And using this learned model, you can actually do joint reasoning. Uh, so you can think of it like this, that the C and the Z are the two variables which allow you to do reasoning over discrete and continuous aspects of this problem. Interestingly, because we are doing this reasoning, I can use this essentially in a model-based control framework where the two variables, both discrete and continuous, can be jointly reasoned about in an end-to-end -end fashion. So I'm not building an explicit planner notice. So now in this case, I can put object-oriented environments, I can sense the objects, and then I can essentially, using this planner, uh, make reasonings about which object to push and where to push it uh, so that you can achieve some sort of constraint objective. So in part two, we basically talked about this idea that geometrically having objects can be thought of as affordances. And, and then if you are in object-oriented environments, thinking about models uh, can give you the ability to do more than just skill learning. You can go to plan. Okay. So, so far, this is pretty good. So we talked about models, right? So in this previous work, the model was fairly simple. We were just simply pushing objects, right? Uh, but what about models becoming slightly harder when we have dynamics? It turns out model learning is, well, non-trivial. That is why model learning is, is hard to scale. Let's play a very simple game. I want you to think about what the model is in the image. 
right? So let me give you the answer for this. This is a ball bouncing in a uh, uh, box with no diameter. Uh, let's do a practice run. What, what would the model be here? This is probably not very high. This is just different numbers of balls bouncing around. Again, no damping and all collisions in the middle. Look carefully here. Notice that some balls are changing direction without collisions. Can you guess the model? Turns out it's actually very hard. You can say there are five balls. I can see five balls, but I don't really know what the connections are. Still think hard. I'm not going to give you an answer yet. <laughs> uh, turns out the model is hard. In this particular case, I made the model to be like this. Uh, if you notice, there are rigid rods, springs, strings. And the model is tricky to guess because there are latent mechanisms. But the real world actually has these sort of latent mechanisms, right? When you think of planets and gravity, it's kind of this. Right? You don't actually see gravity. Uh, you only see objects. And you cannot really memorize this because memorize if you memorize this particular model based on data, I can easily change the type of the links or uh, stiffness of the spring or swap this thing uh, completely without you noticing. The observation will still be the same. So memorization is not good enough. You need to be able to discover this model. And the same idea, by the way, is much more useful if you're trying to build models of environments where full state representation may not be a good idea. For example, fabrics and floors. You don't want to model the whole thing. Some of you might say, oh, I've seen enough shirt folding videos. But then have you seen pant folding and, and pant suit? Uh, and if you still don't believe me, have you seen women's clothes? Uh, uh, they are asymmetric. Uh, often they're never supposed to be folded. They're just supposed to be stored. Uh, but more interestingly, importantly, the idea is that models in the world for objects can be very large uh, variety, and you cannot fix the model a priori. So what we did in this particular case is we built a model of the environment where we start with image input, we assign a budget per object. So you can really think of this budget here as key points on objects. And then these object key points define nodes over which we need to learn a particular dynamics graph. The nodes are here object observations. Edges are defining how these nodes are connected to each other. And each edge may also have properties, for example, stiffness, or in this case, latent set of properties. But you can really think of those properties corresponding to stiffness of a spring or length of a spring uh, or, or strength of a connection so forth. And then using this model, you need to predict dynamics. The important thing to understand is the only supervision that we have is actually through prediction of dynamics. All of the other stuff, the object locations, the edge types, uh, the edge parameters are not supervised. Through. So you only get a video to, to learn. And we can use this idea to learn models of very complicated things where we don't even know ground truth. For example, in this case, we learn a causal model of how a fabric folds. Uh, importantly, notice we don't have the ground truth for, let's say, 10 nodes. For this particular case, this model is actually about 500 by 500 points. So I could do a 500 by 500 node graph, but that would be computationally too heavy. We show here that a reduced order model is sufficient to predict. Uh, most of the motion uh, that we are interested in. And because this model is general purpose, it also works the same model, not separately trained model. Same model also works for different shapes of objects. Let's say in this case, a shirt or a pant. And I can also change the shapes of object by making the pant shorts or maybe making them slightly stiffer. So different fabrics. So, so far, this is important, right? So I told you that we need to represent objects, we need to use objects, and then we need to model objects. And increasingly, we need to think about more structure as we start thinking about these problems, right? We started with representing objects with, uh, with structure of how shapes are built. Then we started using objects through geometry and affordances. And then just now, I told you that to use objects, you need to build better models, and those models may not be just simple neural networks. They need to be causal models. 
So, so far, I've talked about this idea of object-oriented reasoning, but I may even ask a question, what is an object? Let me give you a very simple example, right? If you are an autonomous car driving on the streets uh, of Zurich, there are many cafes lined up on the street. In your representation schema, do you think you will identify the cup sitting on the top of a table or the handle of the door of, of, uh, of the cafe? I would argue no, because for a car, neither of those objects result in any change in action. The fact that the door has a handle or not has no bearing to how the car will drive. So if I am a car, then I will never learn to recognize the handle because it's of no consequence to me. On the contrary, if I was a humanoid walking on the side of the road, then perhaps knowing what is a handle is useful because then I need to use it to open the door. So the point is, that even the notion of what is an object is not an absolute truth. It is dependent on the morphology and the set of tasks you are expected to do. So the notion of object should emerge, not be pre-trained or pre-decided. So this is where we started using or looking into models, what, is, what are called slot models, where we want to do unsupervised object discovery and use those models for decision making. So slot attention is this idea where you are given a particular, uh, let's say, data set. In this particular case, let's say a video. And you, you initialize your representation very simply. You think of this as slots as bins. You don't explicitly say what will go into the bins, but you only say things that will go into the bin are essentially independent components of the environment. right? And depending on what you are going to do with the bin, things that are needed independently for your decision-making process will be separated, others will not be separated. So in this particular case, you can really think of it as the background and each of the objects will automatically be separated or should be separated. And you can, in principle, uh, learn dynamics of these objects independently. Notice this is completely unsupervised. So you're not given object locations, no detectors, no nothing. Uh, there's nothing pre-trained in a sense. And what we did was we built on this idea of filling out slots, but actually figuring out how to learn dynamics over these, uh, these slots. So you can go from images to slots and then extend this idea to build dynamics. So you can basically build this autoregressive causal dynamics where you can predict what the state of the world would be by moving all of the independent objects as you think. And then you can predict rollouts. So if you look at the ground truth for just video prediction task, we basically are able to show that the ability to look at object-oriented representations enables us to do what I would say semantically correct things. For example, mass preservation. If an object moves from one point to another point, the object stays in the frame, right? So the object remains intact. The color doesn't change. So the features at levels of objects stay. So and not only are we able to do sharp reconstruction, but it's preserving semantics. Now, what can we use it for? Well, first of all, uh, we can try to answer questions. I can ask, uh, for example, in this case, will an object collide with objects? Notice that this is a complex question that requires multiple collisions to be able to understand what will happen. So we look at an observed set of frames, we do a future uh, prediction rollout, and we show that our models, uh, purple in this case, are basically state of the art for visual question answering compared to other models which are specially built for this particular task. Importantly, as I said, that the model needs to do predictions of variety of objects and multiple collisions uh, to be able to answer this question. So the prediction needs to be fairly correct. Not only this, we can now also ask it to make decisions, not just question answers. So this is a game where the game is, 
that you need to put the red balls somewhere in the in in this physics puzzle and let the physics play through such that at the end of the episode the green object should touch the blue object it's one of those brain puzzles that people play on their phones uh, and it's a procedural environment you can make many 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 variants of this environment but it really requires you to understand the notion of collisions and at least 2d physics fairly long term with multiple bodies right one could argue it requires a lot of reason uh, and these are not trivial actually interestingly we showed that our model can learn this model fairly fairly well and is actually uh, very competitive with specialized models which are built for this task the important thing to understand is in this particular case we looked at three different tasks video prediction question answering and now decision making but we did not build the model for this particular task the model is built general purpose object discovery and dynamics and it just so happens that the model is indeed state of the art or near state of the art on multiple tasks uh, so so far we talked about object representations and then modeling objects I think I have about 15 minutes. Now I do want to switch gears to show you that structure is not just a problem of representation because a lot of the times we always think of this purely in representation space. Structure is indeed a part of decision making as well. So when we think about structure, particularly in vision and language, you must have seen a lot of deep learning papers uh, or machine learning papers of late. Uh, we talk about structure in the sense of what are relational inductive biases, maybe independence or locality as in CNNs, or maybe we have attention mechanisms as we have in transformers, uh, and we have different kinds of loss functions, whether it's transfer or contrasting. But if we look at a decision-making problem, particularly from the perspective of, let's say, uh, a reinforcement learning kind of setup, where you may interact with an environment, there may be a policy or a controller. The controller could be a learned controller, and there may be uh, an update rule to the controller. And there is an, uh, a robot that, that gives you some sort of cost function out of that. The problem is that this line of work, particularly pure reinforcement learning, has indeed helped us get very far in doing interesting tasks. But when we look at the kind of things we want to do, either learning very fast, where I like this example of an elephant born with a very hard to learn, hard to control trunk, of which it may not know the model of, but very quickly it is able to learn how to control a very complex object to use it uh, in very, let's say, intuitive uh, control tasks. And at the same time, uh, many humans, not just humans, actually most mammals who, who have a neocortex, are able to interact with a large set of environments, open-ended tasks, to understand the models of the world. None of those things are really existent in these current models. So the question we should be asking is, what sort of structure is required for well, decision making? Or is there a question of structure? Is it always in perception? I argue it's not. To understand this, let's go deeper in an RL model. Right. So we started with the simple diagram of observation in control output and in that, but there's more to it. First of all, more often than not, if you are a real roboticist, you are very likely going to process your observation with some sort of perception into some state. This doesn't always have to be end to end. Sometimes this would, this would be a pre-process. Let's say the state is now fed into a controller. That controller outputs some abstract action, but that action can often be decoded as well. Maybe you are not operating in uh, talk space. Maybe you're operating in a defector space that converts it to talk space using maybe dynamics of the robot and PID controllers. And if you look at the box inside agent, there is more to it. In addition to a controller, sometimes you will also have a transition model or a model of the dynamics, and maybe even a utility model or a value function. And depending on how you use this, uh, it might either be called planning or learning. And there will be some sort of update rule. And, and the question is, what insights can be built in this problem of learning by interaction? This problem is often solved with an algorithm or algorithmic family called off-policy RL. We will not get into details of this, but let me explain the high-level uh, high pitch of this is, you start with interacting with an environment. 
you collect some data. Using that data, you fit a value function. Value function is basically your estimate of what the utility uh, of taking an action in a current step is. And using that utility function or a value function, you can figure out what the improved policy is, and then you can iterate this loop. It is called off policy because the policy that is interacting to collect the data and the policy that you are updating may not always be the same. That's all. That's all the things you need to do. So let's ask, where is structure first? Let's do something simple first. When we do deep learning, we often estimate Q functions or value functions with NLP. Can we do better? We found that better architectures improve performance. In this particular case, it was very simple that we tried uh, ResNet architecture. ResNet architectures are basically these architectures which provide hierarchical connections or skip connections as it's called, uh, which allow you to learn representations at different levels of abstractions. And we found that such a minor change, something that is very well known in computer vision when applied to reinforcement learning, improved performance across all benchmarks to a point where we were very surprised because it did not feel like, well, very deep science. Uh, it was small changes that we were able to discover such a large performance. So uh, lesson here is that there is structure. It's just that we don't have a lot of understanding of where the structure needs to be put in. Another problem was we have always been thinking, especially when we think of reinforcement learning and sometimes even control, by the way, we, we are solving infinite horizon problems. When we estimate Q function, we are basically saying, what is the best action I can take now? Assuming for infinity, this is the, this is the Q function or this is the policy I will follow. But many times that's not what you do. If I give you an exam right now with 10 questions and I give you that there are only 20 minutes to solve them, are you going to solve the hardest question first? Or are you going to solve the questions in order? It's likely that you'll flip through the exam and find the easiest question. Why? Because that's the best bang for buck. While if the same exam was given to you for take home, maybe it doesn't matter because, well, in a, in a very long enough horizon, you can solve this problem differently. So the policy indeed depends on the horizon. So then why should the value function not depend on the horizon? So we changed that and we created these what we call horizon aware policies, which are cumulative accessibility. Well, notice that the value function has this term H that enables you to do this. Uh, if we go back to our RL problem, it's not just that uh, uh, we need to do it in Q functions. I already showed you a few minutes ago that transition models can be structured. We, ought to, we talked about this just uh, a few minutes ago about this. But even when we are learning transition models, often when we do deep learning or model-based, deep learning-based, model-based RL, uh, we say that models should be learned for correct prediction. Uh, but what is the correct prediction? Uh, do you say correct prediction is just predicting everything in the environment? If, again, you are an autonomous car, do you care what the shape of the cloud is and how it evolves? Uh, over time, likely not. Predicting everything in the environment is not necessarily the right thing to do. You need to predict things that matter to the task. So we have been working on ideas of what we call value aware or task aware decision making. Uh, so model learning should basically be focused on what you are going to use the model for, and that can enable you to learn much more efficiently in the sense you don't need to predict uh, quantities that could very well be just noise or are not relevant. And the model capacities can be very low, so you're much more efficient from a compute perspective. Not just that, we have also shown that perception modeling matters. So for example, what is the choice of the state, especially when you have multimodal input matters. In our past work, we have shown that you can learn these multimodal state representations. And if learned correctly, they make policy representation easy. The same thing actually also is possible on the output stage. Doing search in the right abstract space matters a lot. We showed that if you're doing reinforcement learning for let's say a robot, Doing it in the correct action space matters. In this particular case, we showed that 
the right action space is variable impedance control in end effector spaces. And that allows us to do sim to real without a lot of engineering. And interestingly, this was not limited just to robots or manipulators. We can also do the same thing for uh, legged robots. We were able to show that if learning happens in the centroidal action space, then you can control or you can compute the, uh, the torques on each of the joints with, and also the forces that uh, appear due to ground reaction uh, using MVC. So this is basically ideas where if you know something about the problem, the structure helps a lot in learning. So I just gave you an example where you can do data augmentation, you can change model architecture, you can change the value function, the objective of your function itself, state and perception encodings. So there's a lot of structure that we're leaving on the table if we try only an end-to-end -end simple learning problem naively. So far, I only talked about skills, but in real world, especially in long-term decision making, a lot of the times we need to think beyond skills. We need to think about structuring skills. So in the five minutes I have left, I want to show you uh, one thing that we have been really working on uh, about how to go from skills to uh, planning in a more general sense. So one thing that we got a lot of inspiration from was this idea of imitation. It has been shown that humans in general learn a lot of their skills, not from trial and error, but often from well, looking at things. For example, uh, I can look at my mom cooking to figure out what a recipe of making eggs is. Or I can look at YouTube. Uh, in fact, half of YouTube and now TikTok is actually just how to use. So in the next part, I want to talk about how we go from skills to uh, to decision making for long term complex skills, and this is not because we don't have data. People in in robotics have tried uh, a lot of approaches uh, where people started with with uh, with data in vision and language. But robotics never had the scale of the data. So, so people created a lot of approaches where they were able to show that, that they can collect a lot of data. This is some of our previous work. But these days, actually, a lot of the uh, groups have resorted to something similar where they collect a lot of physical data in easy to use interfaces and scale the data to show them that, that uh, uh, I can compute, I can collect data on very complex large scale tasks and perform learning. But generally, if you are given data, if you know this, in particularly in robot learning, data is very simple. So for example, if a mom is trying to teach a kid how to, let's say, sweep, then often a robot is very simple, similar to a very young baby where the motion may match, but really not much may be happening, right? As the baby grows up, it needs to understand that Completing a task requires sequencing. And when they grow up even more, they realize it's really not just sequencing, it's really about causality and the purpose, right? You need to understand the objective of the task and perhaps the action space that you need to reason about might be different than what, the, what was displayed or, or demonstrated to. So to that end, we really need to think about understanding the what and the where or, and the how of the task. So what is, if you are given a task objective, let's say open a door or open a jar, what does it mean to open something, right? I can be given more instructions, maybe take a jug, open fridge, put the jug in the fridge. And I argue that this understanding is causal understanding through some sort of generated model. This is again inspired by neuroscience where people have argued that humans have something called predictive coding where we can separate the what and the how, where we can do an understanding of what needs to happen to the environment and then separate that from how to solve that problem. And this is something that we can also attempt with robotics, right? Understanding what needs to happen can then be given as a goal to let's say a controller or even a planner to attempt with, uh, with 
with a planner of different morphologies and, and you can attempt to open a dishwasher or an oven uh, with different agents with very open-ended description of the task. So let's talk about the first problem, which is basically, how do I do generation? In this case, I want to remind you that we talked about this idea of slots. So we can basically build a very similar model. I'm not gonna get into details of this for the interest of time. We are already over, over time right now. But we basically had a paper at CVPR this year where we were able to show that using predictive models, we can learn separable object-oriented models which can predict what needs to happen to the environment purely in image space using language condition data. So I can basically say, take kettle, open oven, put kettle in oven. And importantly, because this is a causal model, I can start from the same state, provide a different input as in this case, and compute a counterfactual prediction that has never been seen before. So what this really allows us to do is to scale this model uh, to, to do counterfactual predictions. This work was already done last year. This space has moved very, very fast. And we keep seeing new and interesting models in this space every day. This is something that came out two weeks ago, not our work, where people can now edit images to do, can you give me an open box image? Right? It gives me essentially the ability to decide what needs to happen. And once I have this ability to figure out what needs to be changed to the environment, I can go and actually attempt to change that now. So essentially, you are given an object-centric planner. Now you need to basically figure out, given the goal, how can I convert this into a plan? And in collaboration with ETH, we have actually shown that you can now, with very little information and predictive, uh, predictive models, come up with controllers that will open and close or interact with open-ended environments without knowing a priori information. So this is uh, joint work with Marco Hutter's lab at ETH, uh, where we showed that you can interact with these objects without knowing 3D models of these objects ahead of time, or even estimating 3D models of these things ahead of time. The only thing in this case we are predicting is uh, the location and the future positions of the handle that needs to be uh, so that we can basically do control. The important thing to note here is this is purely model predictive control or MPC uh, or optimal control here for the robot part. The only learning really is in where the object should be. Uh, and, and because we are doing model predictive control, we get all of the niceties out of this in the sense that uh, if there is a human in the environment, we can do reactive control. Uh, this is very efficient, fairly fast, and can be put on real robots. So really, the whole point of this thing is that if you can separate the what and how, then the what can be learned from perception at a large scale, and then uh, you can solve the how directly using many known mechanisms of control. So taking a step back, we talked about imitation, talked about main three things today, right? That object-oriented representations, structure and decision-making, and causality. But if there is only one thing that you take away today, please let me do this. That both structure and data are required for building next generation of robot learning models. We need to often study intelligent behavior for inspiration, not necessarily to build biological equivalents, but function. I'm here and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, then. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. And the floor is open for, question, for questions. At least for the ones who are, <laughs> who are still here. Maybe I can ask a question. Absolutely. Um, at least in the setting of the these assembly models uh, or problems. Uh, um, What's, uh, what's the achievable performance there? Um, should it be 100%? So that's sort of what we should aim for? Or, no. uh, we, well, we should aim for that, but I don't think we are close to 100% at all, actually. We are very far away from, from that. Uh, these problems, particularly geometric assembly, is particularly uh, tricky because uh, even connecting two parts 
of arbitrary known shape is not easy. So far, we are getting good performance purely in vision, but I would assume when you go from vision to robotic, you probably want to do multimodal fixing where you also use, let's say, contact information. Now, if you go from multi-part, let's say pairwise assembly to multi-part assembly, that becomes much more tricky because currently there are no simple algorithms to even predict the sequence that is uh, dynamically feasible. So let's say, if I tell you build a chair, like a learning-based model might say, put one leg on the top and then put other legs. But the problem is this intermediate thing is not going to stay stable upright. Uh, so it's not physically viable. You have to figure out a plan which where, for example, flip the top, put it down, put the legs upside down, then flip it up and then put the back. That might be a more physical, phys viable way to do it. But currently this sort of planning doesn't yet exist. Uh, so the jump from object representations to embodied plans is something that is not yet uh, not yet existing. Uh, this is a very open-ended area, I believe. But let's say, what's, at what success rate uh, do you think we can say, okay, we, we've solved the problem? Because also humans cannot uh, you know, get to 100%, I guess, right? So I think that, that would really depend on many things. Right? What do you mean by solving the problem? Solving the problems in perception? Yes, that could potentially be thing that I think we can think that we can attempt to solve this problem in a few years. Uh, to attempt to solve this problem for a real robot, I don't think we can solve this problem in generality because we don't even have good hands. Right? A lot of these things require dexterous manipulation for which we don't actually have the hardware for or the sensing for. And even if we had that, we don't have low level policies for, for example, we don't know how to screw things in a general generic setting. Uh, so, so there are many, many things uh, that are there right now that may not be reachable yet uh, in, a, in a most, what you would say, open-ended sense of the problem. In, in, let's say, slightly more constructed set of the problems, this might be possible. Okay, great. Uh, are there uh, other questions? Well, if not, then thanks a lot again. Thanks and, a lot. Uh, see, you all, no. see you all next week. Absolutely. Thanks. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me and thanks a lot for sticking around. I really had a wonderful time and hopefully I'll get to meet some of you sometime in person. Yes. Thanks, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us.